Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Sander Lanch podcast. I am Data, and let me give you a brief rundown of what we're going to be doing. The show is going to involve us reading through the work of Brandon Sanderson a couple chapters at a time and then discussing it in depth. I have read all of this already, but my three co-hosts have not read any of it. They don't know anything, I hope, more or less, about uh, what we're going to be reading and what the whole universe of his works is like. So it should be interesting as we get into it. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Uh, My name is Dak. I am 31 years old and I'm from Australia. I'm Jamie. I'm also 31 and from Australia and married to Dak. I am uh, Joe. I am 30 and I am from Texas and I am the brother of the main host, Data. Wow, I didn't realize that I was the oldest one also. You guys are all, like, really close in age. Interesting. Okay, and so let's get into it. Grab onto something, everybody. The Sander Lanch is about to begin. My revolution carries me in a moment lost in time. So we're starting with Mistborn, The Final Empire, the pref- the preface. Oh, I almost said, is that what it's called, preface? Or is it called, right, now i got to go back and look, prologue. prologue. See, I, I'm, I'm, I didn't even read it correctly. Read the prologue and arts. chapter one. Yeah, I know. I need to have all the notes in front of me. I've actually got the book up on my Kindle app or uh, my Kindle for the computer in front of me, so I can look at it as we go. But see, we started off on the right foot. Prologue and chapter one today. How did you guys feel about these, like, overall, your first introduction to this world? Well, I've got questions to start with, but like, on the whole, it was, in, it was you know, cool to read and, you know, definitely whet the appetite. Yeah. Well, well, give me an example. What kind of questions did it leave you with? Um, well, uh, obviously, it's, like, how the powers and everything of this universe work, because obviously there are some. Uh, both the prologue and chapter one had, like, these italicized someone giving a monologue and we don't know who that is so i feel like we're gonna have to get into that at some point and um yeah what's gonna because stuff seems crazy especially at the end of the prologue so what's gonna come of that and what's gonna happen to this world what about you jamie what do you think yeah i liked it i um i don't tend to read a lot of this um this kind of thing the, the fantasy um side of things so it it really it kind of threw you into it straight away. There's no, no mucking about, you know, you're introduced to everybody and, and sort of really like in the middle of it straight away. And there's, there's a lot to absorb um, from the prologue in chapter one, you know, three sort of different settings straight away. And you just try to catch up and um, really, I, I found myself reading something and then going, wait, did I read that? Did I imagine that? I don't even know. So I think, <laughs> falling into this, this world. <laughs> yeah, this this world. Is, it sounds like it's going to be pretty crazy, and and pretty involved, which is is pretty cool. I'm sort of keen to learn a bit more about it. What kind of stuff do you usually read? I like. I, I know you and your preferences the least of anybody on here, so I'm curious. Yeah, I am. Um, I I quite like um, crime, <laughs> so I'm reading the Kathy Reich's books at the moment. So like forensic crime and and things like that. So. Yeah, not oh, not a lot so like of fantasy. Really so detailed crime. Yeah, I did I did my degree in forensics, so it kind of up my alley. But yeah, this is this is nice. This is a bit different, so I'm excited to learn a bit more. I guess it makes sense if that's your degree, you would be interested in that sort of. Yeah. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Joe? What do you think of the for the first two bits? Um. Well, and and this is where I have trouble. Uh, it's really hard for me, and this may be why I've never read his stuff before. It's really hard for me to get into a book when I'm thrown into what seems like the middle of an ongoing story, and I don't know where I am or what's going on or who these people are. So while I did enjoy kind of the mystery of it at the same time, that's why I love Jim Butcher, but I can't get into Codex Alira because I felt like I don't know anything about this story. It's confusing to me, and... But of course, this is just the prologue in the first chapter. Or so, but I, I like the character in the prologue. The character in the first, uh, the main character in the prologue, or what seems to be the main character in the prologue, Kelsier, I guess. Um, but I don't know how I, yeah, I don't yeah. know how I feel about Vin uh, yet because we haven't seen much of her. So, 
Right? Well, she's been in a situation where it's really hard for her to show off her personality because otherwise she might get smacked in the face. So, right. Yeah, I did like true. I did like how she has some kind of luck powers. I thought that was pretty cool. But mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, it's very very mysterious how the the magic is working right now. And that's if anybody I know Dak has read the Dresden Files. I don't know if you've looked at uh, Jim Butcher's other series, The Codex Alera, but in have, that yes. one, in in the Dresden Files, like he explains in detail a lot like this is how the magic works this is what magic is because like harry dresden is like a teacher of like or a big magic nerd and he's teaching the reader at at all times like this is how magic works in codex alera it's 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 very based in science yeah it is it's whatnot and i think i think you'll find as we go that uh actually brandon sanderson tries very hard to keep his magic scientific he's a master of hard magic systems which uh is like magic with hard rules and we'll talk more about that when we learn kind of more about the magic. I've got like some some outside quotes by him and stuff like that that I want to show y'all as we learn more about the magic. But in Jim Butcher's Codex Alera series, he just drops you in. He's like, okay, magic is happening. You figure out how it works. I'm not telling you because everyone in this universe already understands how it works. So it's very two different, very different approaches. And I can understand why Joe's saying he's like, I can't get into that as much where they're not explaining anything to you. I don't think you'll have that problem as much as we get more into this book, but I guess we'll find out. But okay. I guess, yeah, for, for the setting, the scene, like, they'll definitely set up, these are the powers, and they sort of vaguely hint at how they work, but they don't give you the details, so I was like, well, I guess i got to set right. up, number, number one, that there are powers, before, number yeah. two, how they work. Mm-hmm. Right, I, like, the, the line, it's kind of almost a throwaway line in the prologue, where he's like, I, I know I had some, whatever it was, iron in my stomach, or I could feel it, or whatever, and I was like, so wait, he eats metal? I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> I had that thought as well. Like the the thought that immediately popped into my head was like, "What well, does this dude have? Like a can of baked beans? He cracks the can, pours out the beans, and eats the can." <laughs> That's an excellent. I, I, I love that picture. I was just thinking, like when he as he said that, I was like thinking, like you take off a bottle cap and you eat the bottle cap instead of the drinking the bottle. But I like yours better. Yeah, and that and that like thought was almost helped by the fact that he brought all this food to these people, and they were like, uh, "He was like, aren't you going to eat any?" He's like, "No, nah, I'm good." Oh, I didn't oh, notice that. Yeah. So maybe he just survives off of metals is your theory at this point. No, I, I really don't know. Maybe it's like a, he can eat uh, regular food. He just chooses not to. I mean, all, we also know that he did raid the, the stores for that. So I guess he could have eaten his portion yeah. before then. But that's I reckon true. he was snacking earlier, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> While everyone else is working, he, Kelsey is yeah. just like snacking. Okay, yeah. we're, we're getting into details. Let's get into the details of the <laughs> chapter before we just pick a random spot in the middle, I guess. Yeah. So, the very beginning, we have this italicized part, which I guess I guess is called an epigraph. Uh, what and, – and each – both chapters had one. So, what do you guys think just of this in general? Like, uh, it, it, you know, of this style of writing where you're including something weird at the beginning of your chapters or specifically of any of the specifics in here? Well, in the first one, in front of the prologue, it specifically mentions, like, you know, he's the hero of ages, the savior. And then in front of the other chapter, the first chapter, where he he says, perhaps another person reading my life would name me a religious tyrant. And I'm like, okay, those two things together make me think, is this the emperor, like, uh, who set up the final empire? Because, like, just from the vague hints that were dropped throughout the chapters, like, he... Like, he up, up turned everything turned the sky red and everything went to hell under his rule but you know the biggest tyrants always think they're in the right so he still probably still thinks of himself as a hero but he's entertaining the idea that yeah i could be a tyrant to someone else i don't know that was the impression i got anyway so it would be interesting if it is the 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 tyrant ruler of this empire or whatever if you know he's sitting there thinking to himself you know am i really am i a bad guy because I, yeah. I guess usually you don't get introspective evil tyrants uh, in these stories. You you don't, you don't have somebody sitting there being like, huh, I wonder if I'm the bad guy. Well, I gotta yeah. gotta do what you gotta do. Did anyone else but he feel specifically like specifically calls himself the hero of ages? Yeah. So I'm like, all right. So and it's capitalized too, as if hero of ages is like a it, thing. Yeah, that's like a well-known title or something. Anyone else feel that same way or different ways about the intros? Um, the, the intros to me kind of almost seem like Skyrim where you find a book and it's just got some stuff in it. That's kind of background or tertiary. Like I almost felt like it didn't have anything to do with the story. Like it was almost a quote from, um, from some person in the world that doesn't actually have anything to do, uh, with what the, with how the story's unfolding. 
probably just like thoughts or uh, things that apply philosophically to what's going on, but not necessarily specific to a character in the in the story. Yeah, and I've seen books that do that, that have quotes from either real or fictional people within the universe. Like, I, I read a book the other day that had, like, uh, a Winston Churchill quote at the beginning of one chapter, and it just kind of, I guess it's supposed to set up the theme for the chapter, that this famous quotation. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I feel like if it's if it's the, the writings of a character that maybe we're yet to meet, it'll make a little bit more sense as we move through the books. Okay, so... We'll move into the into the beginning of the prologue. The very first line I kind of want to talk about is "Ash fell from the sky." What kind of picture does that kind of paint of this world for you? Like, what do you see when you read that? Shit's messed up. <laughs> that's, that's, that's probably true. In, in 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 a world that's working correctly, you wouldn't have ash falling from the sky. Yeah. Yep. I guess my first thought was like, are we in the middle of a disaster? Like I I kind of you know you think about like volcanoes erupting and and things going quite wrong yeah I was I sort of didn't pick it as being that was like the normal when I first read the line I was like oh no what have we what have we dropped into but I mean it definitely paints a picture of a pretty horrific place yeah again for me um, I was going to say, again, for me, I'm going to make another Elder Scrolls reference. It, it <laughs> reminded me of uh, Morrowind, the, the dark elf country in that world. Um, the, the, a big volcano erupted, and so ash just like routinely falls from the sky there all the time. And so it just, it just gave me that picture of obviously there was some kind of volcanic disaster or something, and now that's just a part of their life is that ash falls from the sky. So in the in the game, did of the, the volcano erupt once and ash falls like forever? Yeah, it's like a it's like a constantly active volcano. And oh, okay, so it's constantly and, kind of like belching out. Ash yeah, or something? Okay. yeah. That makes more sense than one time like a hundred years ago a volcano <laughs> erupted and there's still ash falling. We're, we're still getting it. <laughs> but I, I I like Jamie's point that it kind of starts out you're like maybe this is just a you know there's a current disaster going on and it, this is not a normal thing should not be a normal thing. And I feel like he kind of tries to address that because when we get to the beginning of chapter one, the very first line of chapter one is, again, ash fell from the sky, as if he's trying to get you used to the fact that this is the thing that happens. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe it's just still part of the same disaster, I guess. It's possible. So after that, we meet a couple of characters. We've got Lord Tresting, and he is annoyed that ash is falling on his pretty outfit that he just bought that just came on a canal boat. And he is talking... Well, he watches the peasants work to an obligator. So the whole se- the, the, the setup of the beginning of the chapter is this guy standing out here with this more important dude, and they're watching the peasants work, as it says. I think I, I, I just like to note that I think this may be the only time the word peasants actually appears in the book. Is when it, he says like the peasants were an indolent, unproductive lot, and then he calls them another name after that, and I think that is the name that's used for the rest of the book. The author wanted you to know that this word means peasants, so he was going to introduce them with peasants. Makes what do you guys sense. think of trusting and the obligator and what is going on here? Yeah, I have no time for trusting. <laughs> he <laughs> doesn't sound like a nice person at all. You know, the, the he's worried about the ash falling on his clothes. You know, it's it's like really, dude, that's the most important thing going on to you right now. But yeah, it it just paint yeah paints this picture of. I guess that this life, is, you know, maybe maybe this ash is normal. Like, no one seems to be panicking or anything. So this is just the setting that we've got. He's obviously, you know, this rich guy, probably in a position of power. Yeah, all these servants, and I doubt he treats them very well. And, you know, using the, you know, peasants, they're unproductive. They're people in brown smocks. Like, they're not, they're not wealthy. They're not treated well. You know, it's... It, He's not going to be, yeah, a good guy. He's obviously looking to grab himself some more power too. By the way that he's talking and in, in his inner monologue about the obligator, and um, what's I guess he's not that interesting to me, especially because we, you know, what happens later in the prologue. But the obligator is very interesting to me. Obligators, inquisitors. It sounds very much like some kind of religious kind of sect of people that. Uh, like a Spanish Inquisition almost. They they are like the enforcement of laws and like the empire. 
but in a like a, almost a religious sect kind of way. So um, I'm I'm pretty yeah. interested to see how that is expanded or or uh, explained. Yeah, so it's, it definitely it, it talks about obligators and it kind of there's a lot of like information dump in this prologue to try to get you to understand the world with uh, while trying to keep it you know interesting and not just telling you stuff he goes into details about you know this guy had this many eye tattoos while like more less important people had less eye tattoos and that was how you tell how important an obligator is and then there's this it comes up later when he talks about the the inquisitor which i get how you get spanish inquisition from that and the two of them are talking about mm-hmm. you know how lazy the ska are which every time i read ska it makes me think of, you know like a band but <laughs> uh, and the, the alligator's like, oh, you should see the ska in the city. They're even more lazy. And then he talks about how once upon a time, people tried, they tried to run away, but he executed their families and that stopped that real fast. So clearly he's not, he's not a great guy. And also clearly these are, you know, like slaves. It, it doesn't call them that specifically, but when you start talking about, oh, what happens if they run away? Well, I execute their families if they run away. That's pretty clearly slavery. And it even it goes on to say, like, like all Ska, they belong to the Lord Ruler, trusting only least the workers from his God. And I'm curious when you read that, that the Lord Ruler, that sounds like, you know, some guy who's in charge of stuff. And then it goes on to say that he's their God. So what does that what does that mean to you? Like, is he is he paying like a cult who owns stuff in the name of God? Or is it some guy who also calls himself a God? Or I don't know. I don't know how to take that the first time I, uh, I read it. Um, Lord Ruler, who's who also is God, like to me that that kind of reinforced the thought I was having is that this is like a society that's ruled by a religious sect. And whether there's one Lord Ruler or whether there's many, they're viewed as gods or, you know, sub gods, whatever, you know, what have you, whatever they choose to be known as. It's these inquisitors, these um, these obligators that kind of build the foundation or hold up this theocratic, the, theocratic society of, uh, of religious rulers that are considered themselves as God. You know, just like ancient pharaohs or any any old religious society that viewed their king or their rulers as as gods. That's that's how that's how I felt when I or how I read it when I when I initially saw that. So the Lord Ruler could be like a pharaoh, basically, or even like a, a, a group of pharaohs here. Right. Interesting. What, what, what about our Aussies? I, I, I don't know how religiously inclined either of y'all are in general, but it's a it's, yeah, it's going to be a theme of the book as we go. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it is interesting putting – I hadn't really thought about uh, – I remember thinking when I read it, you know, like when his was capitalized and I was like, hang on a minute, this is <laughs> this is how you would speak about a god, you know. It, yeah, it would be interesting to see how that all comes together and, and you know, matching that with the, the obligators having some kind of, yeah, almost almost religious significance when you, when you read about them. Yeah, definitely be interesting to see how that framework works in that society. Yeah. As far as as far as the obligators go, I think like at one point they explicitly compare them to a pr- like a priest, don't they? Um, trying to find yes. the exact quote. So, all right, if they're the they're the envoys uh, from the from the main body of the empire, the ones who come down and contact the Lord rulers, then obviously there's got to be some religious significance there if with if if, uh, if you've got that comparison. So, I guess I don't know, like why you'd see the Lord rulers as the gods. I don't know. Just the fact that there is an emperor that they answer to, like they're they're probably closer to like the demigods or the servant gods. Or the emperor is like the god above all. I guess he'd be, he'd be the Zeus in this one. Yeah, I guess that would be how that sort of functions. They lean they lean on the peasants to look up at them and worship them, and they treat them like crap. Because, hang on, sorry, train of thought's just coming back. <laughs> yeah, uh, just the fact that they. The scar, they they refer to them as creatures. They treat them as less than themselves. So there is that sort of god and human dynamic. It's like the gods are always like, "Hey, mortal, fuck you," and and just and the god and especially the Greek gods, but a lot of other pantheons would always just treat the mortals like garbage. So that's a similar sort of parallel that you can see through this. If the um, rulers and the emperor and the emperor are the gods, then the peasants are the you know not equal, and they will never aspire to be. They always have to make sure to remind them, "This is your place." 
And that's interesting because it, it's true that the um, clearly the like even Lord Trusting, who I think they kind of established he's like a country lord or something, so he's not as important as like he's the obligator says that very well trusting i'll carry your proposal to lord venture and so he's like oh he's he's you know he's trying to get some more power like joe was saying at the beginning and so he's not particularly powerful himself but clearly he feels that he is way over the slave class if it even is a class he, he like dax said he he's, they talk about them like they're a different species practically like they're animals and so i was trying to build this picture of what these creatures were when i first read it um, and I thought Dak's point was really interesting that, yeah, no, it's not that they're a creature necessarily, but that that what we're seeing is, you know, the human, this, this nobleman, you know, they believe they are just a superior being. So that actually makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah, I never even thought about that at first, that, you know, by the time you get to, to the first few paragraphs, you haven't seen anything. They haven't talked about, like, details about them. They they talk about them like they're creatures, but they don't, you don't, might not even realize that they're kind of human until later when you hear them talking and like actually yeah. encounter them some yeah okay so we get more world building the obligator's looking at his pocket watch which i think says an interesting thing about what you expect the level of technology to be in this world but i'm not sure that we see that coming through necessarily and we get some more world building where he talks about how the sun is red yeah because so, as if you don't need a further indicator that things are not right right yeah that that, that also kind of just screams it's like that's that's not what you want. No. That's, <laughs> the obligator uh, doesn't have a name, does he? Or at least it hasn't. It doesn't come up here. No, they they seem to just talk about him as the obligator. I don't think they ever mention his name. They say that this that he is Straff Ventures' own obligator. Like he belongs to that guy. So uh, and so it seems guess, like uh, it's just sort of odd. Then it's like he's obviously so important, and interesting, is desperate to impress him, but he do, like either doesn't ha- he doesn't know his name, or if he even has one, it's like does, does the obligator have any personality beyond belonging to Lord Venture, is or is he just purely like uh, like his right hand? He has no identity of his own. That's an interesting point. We don't we don't see a whole lot about him. Yeah, I know it's a bit further down, but I think they named the obligator in chapter one, didn't they? I think that was a different person. Yeah, yeah okay. that's a different obligator. Cause yeah, but I think what she's saying is that they do have names. That oh, one they is have names. Oh, yeah. uh, right, right. We just yeah. don't know this guy's name. Yeah. Unnamed obligator number one. <laughs> <laughs> so Lord Trusting, I mean, I, just to talk a little bit more about what the background seems to be, it's like he's he's obviously got some proposal to this lord, and, it, and you know, the obligator kind of hints at a possible future in Luthadel, which seems to be – you know, maybe a, a, a capital city, if not the capital city. Um, and so it sounds like there's room for advancement, at least for these Lord types. And you kind of, at least I got the sense that the reason he brings up him dallying with the, uh, with the ska is to indicate, you know, that that's, that's actually a crime and that they look, they frown upon that. As, and I'm assuming it's because it could lead to uh, children of ska being, uh, illegitimate heirs to whatever whatever property these nobles might have. So I thought that was uh, an interesting kind of thing that he could, he has the ability to move up from his station and also it's it's taboo to have relations with Ska. I assume for that purpose. Yeah, we get we definitely get. He brings up now. Now I'm trying to find the the point where he brings up. Here, let, let's let's just kind of go through this. So he says he'll take his proposal to Lord Venture, and he's like, I managed to impress the Lord Venture's obligator. And then the obligator says, well, I'm going to go home now. And he's like, but you, you just got here. You're not going to stay for dinner? He's like, no. But there is another matter that I wanted to bring up. I came not only at the behest of Lord Venture, but to look into some matters for the canton of Inquisition, also capitalized. Rumors say that you like to dally with your Ska woman. So I guess that right there hopefully tells us that uh, – these, that the Ska and the Lords are roughly the same species, because if, if they weren't, that would be kind of... I would hope so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, he, say, he says, don't worry. If uh, if there were any real worries for, about your actions, a Steel Inquisitor would have been sent in my place. And then Trusting says, Inquisitor? He'd never seen one of the inhuman creatures, but he'd heard stories. So that, I guess, is seems like a seed for later. There's some sort of inhuman creatures working for uh, yeah. someone in here. <laughs> The 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 enforcers are like when the crimes are really bad, they're the ones who show up and sh- and shut it down. And then he tells him what what I've seen and heard here indicate that you always clean up your messes. So it's it's almost like it's not necessarily that dallying with the skull women is bad because he says no, you're fine. 
it's that you have to clean up after yourself, which is disturbing in in and of itself, I guess. Yeah, it's basically like, don't make your problem become our problem sort of attitude. That's an interesting way to look at it. He's like, yeah, we don't want a problem coming up later. Yeah. And I like the idea that it's like, maybe, you know, they could become heirs to this, uh, the house or something like that if, uh, if there's an illegitimate child. We'll have to see if that's... <laughs> And then just to like further elaborate on the point, he's like, after the, the obligator starts to go, he's like, I'll have to celebrate tonight, he thought. There was that young girl in the 14th Hoffel he'd been watching for some time. So, yeah, I, I think it really hammers in for, or supposed to hammer in for us, that this guy is a garbage human. Yeah, he just treats his um, scar as basically like his, his personal, uh, I don't want to say breeding ground, but uh, I guess just like, you're my property, I can do with you whatever I want, and like if you're a woman my property, that means I can have you whenever I want, which is just despicable. Yeah. Yeah, there's nothing in in, in the entire prologue that's uh, painting him in a positive light. Nope. Which, you know, makes it all that much better for everyone when he ends up dead by the end of the prologue. So <laughs> we can all be happy. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was one thing I was reading, and I was like, okay, I gotta try to remember all these names, because they're throwing a bunch of names at me already. Lord Tresting. Okay, I gotta remember that guy. Lord Tresting, Lord Tresting. And then when I got to the end of the prologue, I was like, oh, never mind, I don't need to remember him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Do you get the impression, like, that anyone, or who, who, who do you think is important in this prologue, basically? Uh, Kelsey, uh, definitely. Yeah, Kelsey, definitely. I yeah. agree. He seems like he'd be a kind of important character. Anybody else that you feel like is going to be showing up again? Maybe I guess the we've old been introduced. man. Sorry, Jamie. I was going to say maybe the maybe oh, the old man, saying... old man Ska. Uh, yeah, menace. Yeah, I think really like the the prologue's done a good job of of setting up sort of the like the types of people and that we're going to run into, and I guess the structure. You know, you've got like who's nobility and and who are the slaves really you know you, we we know that you've got your taskmasters you know you've got your obligators like these these people are going to be people we're going to run into and i guess that first part of the prologue's done a pretty good job of of setting out where people sit which side they're on and their relationships so it may like especially that first bit of the prologue we might not necessarily see those exact characters again but at least we know as we're moving forward, what sort of people they, they or, or what sort of um, characters these these are and the relationships they'll have. Yeah, you feel like you're starting to get a handle on kind of the structure of things vaguely and maybe how the, what the world is like. Yeah. How society yeah. functions. Yeah. Let's, okay, so then Trusting looks out and he sees a guy looking back at him, one of the Ska who, uh, his in his eyes, there was a spark, no, a fire of defiance. And so he's like, oh, I better have that guy beaten. And then he can't find him again, which that in and of itself seems like a, a superpower there is that he turns around and turns back and the guy's gone. He did the Batman thing. Yeah, exactly. He's like, he's Commissioner Gordon now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, asshole. later uh, later in the prologue, they talk about how he just walked off. So obviously I, I am assuming that, that Lord Trustig just missed it because the other Scott definitely noticed. Yeah, and it, it may be that uh, he can't tell them apart. And I mean, he, he even says it's like they were so hard to tell apart. So it may just be that he doesn't cons- consider them interesting enough to differentiate between them. They're all dressed the same, bent over brown plants, trying to keep the ash off. So I guess it would be hard to a bunch of bent over brown robe people uh, differentiate. The, the only mm. real description that Tresting gives of the guy is that he has the spark of defiance. He doesn't notice anything else about him. So right. it's just like it's it's just like something he's not used to seeing on these people. It's like the person themselves is irrelevant, really, how they physically look. It's just, hang on, that's a weird look on that face. But yeah. he doesn't really take notice of what the face itself looks like. Might be hard to find afterwards, yeah. Yeah. And then when he can't find him, he doesn't want to look bad in front of the obligator. So he's like, uh, th- those people are being lazy. Beat them. And the guy's like, okay, I guess. I think it even mentions that the taskmaster, he didn't need a specific reason to give them yeah. to give them a bit. He's like, oh, okay, <laughs> that's fine, which I think says a lot about them too. Makes you wonder if the taskmaster is, you know, one of these, the, the guy handing out the beating, is he one of these, like, lord types? Because he, he clearly works for this guy, or is he, like, a ska who has some more power and he's okay with beating the other ones? I don't think he is a ska because, like, Tresting, like, just doesn't know 
like anything about the scar, but he knows this guy's name. So like if he was a, yeah. if he was a scar, he probably wouldn't have a name, at least not in Tresting's eyes. So that that tells us that if he is one of like the Lord types, then it tells us that they're not all like powerful dudes because this guy's clearly a working man in, out in the fields beating on people. It's tough work. Yep, every Lord needs an enforcer. And if he really has like hundreds of these uh, ska or thousands, then he probably needs more than one of those guys. So he probably has a bunch of them working for him. Keep getting the crops coming in. So then yeah. we move on away from trusting and we get Kelsier's point of view. And he talks about or he thinks about how here he's heard whispers of long ago when the sun was not red and the sky had not been clogged with smoke and ash and so on and so forth. Times before the Lord Ruler. And so there's a hint of something here. Maybe it it, it always makes me wonder. It's like, is that are, are, are there just rumors about, you know, times back then and the world is always like it was now? Or is he saying the Lord Ruler actually physically changed things here? Because that's a lot for the Lord Ruler to have changed, uh, to make the sun a different color. I don't know. It doesn't really go into how long ago he reckons this was, um, does it? No, it just says once long ago and before the Lord Ruler. So before right. that guy, a long time ago. That's all the information we get so far, at least. So, so that, that, could, that could be anything. It could be 70 years. It could be 1,000. Yeah. But still, I mean, even if it's 1,000, I'm like... Changing the color of the sun is a big deal. Like, That's, I don't, you know, how does it, if that happened a thousand years ago, then something really fucked up must have happened a thousand years ago to <laughs> cause that. Unless it's, I guess, like a natural progression. Their sun is turning into a red supergiant or something. <laughs> uh, I mean, it could be that the sun is red because of all the ash. Oh, as well. yeah. Like, so it could just be the way it's shining through like this. They're just so used to it now that they don't see a big yellow ball in the sky. It is just red because it's, it's coming through all of this this ash and, and That's a good point. And, yeah. If the sky's constantly filled with ash, then maybe yeah. that causes it to look differently. That makes total sense. Um, so we get Kelsey you're thinking about all this stuff, and he goes into the ska hovels. Soon the mists would come. And I feel like it's called the, – the, the series is called Mistborn, so – Clearly, the mists have to come into it at some point. And there's a lot of reverence and fear about the mists, uh, among the Scar, at least. Yeah. Uh, and about things that are out there hiding in the mists as well. So you get the impression there's definitely going to be a lot coming to play here. No Scar would venture outside once night arrived. Their fear of the mists was too strong. And he says, I'll so have to them with that someday. So the mists just always come at night, is the like, is the idea there. Yeah, that's, that's definitely what it sounds like. It's like every night there's mists and nobody goes outside. Which... I feel like would make running away really hard. Like you're not gonna run, if, run away from your plantation if you're scared to be outside at night. Yeah. Well, they say that too. That there's the like a lack of, you know, there, there's no guards or anything because they weren't going to go anywhere. So yeah. it's almost like a, you know, the lords don't need to worry about it because they're scared enough to, to stay rather than having to actually put on any security to make sure people don't run away. Also, they'll kill their families. So. Right. Yeah. That 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 can't hurt. <laughs> there's lots of reasons to not go outside. <laughs> And then Kelsier goes inside. He's like, hey, how was everybody's day? And Tepper is like, our day was filled with work, something you managed to avoid. This guy has a real chip on his shoulder. He really does. And Kelsier even says, like, he was young to be an elder. And then we find out there's another guy there older than him. And he's like, why do you let that guy take charge? And the guy's like, eh, you got to pick your battles, man. <laughs> it's not worth it. I can't be bothered. So this is all just like 30 people crammed into one hovel, isn't it? Yep. Like then it's then it's say how many hovels are out there, how many like how many. We know there's at least 14 have working here, at least 14. Yeah, because he says that girl in hovel 14 earlier. So we know there's at least 14 hovels, probably more. All right, so roughly 30 people to a hovel, at least 14. So that's about 400 or so yeah, people. At least. Um, like, how, did it say how many scar trusting had working for him? I don't know. Let's go back and look here. Uh, it says hundreds of people in brown smocks, but I think that's the closest okay. we get to an actual number. Right. Okay, so a whole lot of people crammed into a very small area. Yeah. So it's not a great life for them, but that probably comes with being a slave. Uh, don't expect it to be great, especially slaves who are out working in the fields, bent over all day. Yeah. And it's like, well, you know, the 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 slave masters are bad, but the mists sound worse, apparently. Yeah, I mean, that's got to be pretty bad, right? If the mists are worse than getting beaten all day. Yeah. And Kelsier says, field work hasn't ever really suited me. It's far too hard on my delicate skin and shows 
arms that are lined with layers and layers of thin scars that covered his skin running lengthwise as if some beast had repeatedly raked its claws up and down his arms. So that paints a picture. Or it's something. Been in some battles before. Yeah, whatever happened to him, it could not have been particularly fun. And don't say the rest of him is scarred up, just his arms. For some reason, I don't I don't know, I don't recall this being written in the prologue, but for some reason I wanted to, I got the impression that the mists did that to him. That's the impression I got. I don't know oh. why, if it's not written anywhere, but that's the impression I got, was that the mists made those marks on him. Yeah, okay. I, I think we get a very brief... Hold on, let's let's see if we can get there. So Kelsey talks about all the reasons that people get beatings. He once saw a guy get beaten because his master said he blinked inappropriately. And then he's like, hey, here's all this food. Oh, okay, now here he's men who venture out into the mist lose their souls, a woman whispered, when Kelsey starts to actually try to leave. And they're like, no, no, don't go outside. And then he's Sorry, like, trying to find the page. people, it's like, had Kelsey walked in the mist? What then had happened to his soul? You know, I've probably blinked at somebody in, in such a way as to deserve a beating. <laughs> <laughs> That's impressive. I don't think that I, I've managed that. I, I had a teacher tell me that I rolled my eyes at her once, and I was in, like, like second grade or something, and I had no idea what rolling your eyes meant. So I'm like, <laughs> I, 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 don't, I, I don't know what that is. And she's like, don't, don't give me that. You know what I'm talking about. You rolled your eyes at me. I'm like, no, literally, I have no idea what that means. Like, I've heard the expression, I don't know how to do it. And I think eventually I convinced her, and she's like, "It's like it's doing this." And I was like, "Oh, okay. Well, I didn't mean to do that. If I did that, <laughs> you, I to you. you totally did. You meant to. <laughs> yeah, I totally meant to do the thing, but I had no idea. Like, I'm just oh. trying to picture, like, how how can you blink at someone wrong? Like, I understand it's it's meant to be like uh, this right. is obviously how messed up society yeah. is, but even even so, it's like, what does that look like? Yeah, well, you just have a, you know, you blink in such a way as to display some really, like, shitty, like, uh, personality. Like, oh, God, look at this guy. Blink, blink. <laughs> I, I don't know that you I, I, I can understand if you're moving your eyes in some direction while you're doing it. Like, if you're doing an eye roll or, like, looking away or something. But just staring at them, blink, blink. I don't, I, I can't picture it. Hey, man, I work with customers face to face all the time, and I'll blink, and they'll be like, you know, what's your problem, man? Be like uh, nothing. <laughs> My eyes need Maybe moisture. It's, a bit like a, <laughs> it's like a Morse code or something. Maybe he's said something with his eyes he didn't know he right. said, and that was like, yeah. nope, not having that. Three quick, three quick, three quick blinks. That's a sign for <laughs> asshole. Yep. <laughs> Ugh. Yeah, like this guy have a shit life. Yeah, I, th- I think that it, that's drilled home pretty well in this chapter. Uh, so Kelsier starts talking about, like, he's like, oh, I guess I'm staying. Uh, and he says that he's come from the north, where the Lord Ruler's touch is less noticeable. And uh, the Lord Ruler lets his lords decide what to do over out there. And one man, Lord Renu, I don't know how you pronounce that, R-E-N-O-U-X, has even ordered his taskmaster to stop unauthorized beatings. And he's considering paying them wages. And Tepper's like, bullshit. You don't pay slaves. So what do you guys think? Is Kelsey honest here? Is, is is there actually somebody out there about to be paying their ska? I, I didn't. Uh, I I didn't think he was being dishonest, but he may have been. He may have been uh, oh, exaggerating a bit to try to get them to think, you know, because that's that seems to be his mission. There is he's trying to get them to think differently. Like this is you know this isn't the only life you could have. You could have a different kind of life, and um. And then he kind of, you know, will get there, but he kind of forces them to have a different kind of life because of what he does next. But Yeah, he's trying to inspire the uprising any way he can. And it's like, all right, words didn't do the trick, so later on he does something a bit different. Then he pulls out some sarcasm in response to him. He's like, my apologies. I didn't realize that Goodman <laughs> Tepper had been to Lord Renew's estates recently when you dined with him last. Did he tell you something? I, I, I love the sarcasm. I can't get enough of super sarcastic characters. <laughs> So I love that bit. It's, it's always good just to see like the the arrogant like guy just be, just be like, no, I know what's going on. You can't do that. You got to. And then someone just goes, yeah, shut up, mate. Just completely shut down the dickhead. And it kind of does. Uh, it, you know, he's like he, he, he Tepper blushed, and then he says he he tries to come back, and he's like, I know who you are. You're you're the one they call the survivor. Those scars on your arms give you away. So apparently the scars that he has on his arm are somewhat unique in that they label him as the survivor. What, what, what do you think he survived? Maybe, maybe well, that was, was... W- yeah. And th- sorry, sorry, Dak, I didn't mean to cut you off there. 
but that's right. that maybe that's where I got that idea of, the, of it being the mist because they're all afraid that like you know you go out in the mist you don't come back. Yeah, like mm. you call, always, always get called a survivor if you do something that no one thinks you can survive, which seems to be the mist in this case. So I don't have the book in front of me, so I can't really double check it, but. I sort of I thought there was a reference to him like being in a pit or something like he when he's talking to Menace I thought they have a conversation about yep. something along those lines Jamie um, is yep. exactly right because they he, he he gives them the food and then while they're eating the older guy comes over he's like yeah I don't want any of that food it upset my stomach but he says let's see let's see if I can get to it yeah, I've got, I've got it here. So uh, Menace looks at his scars and says, yeah, I've seen scars like this on someone else. Like He was trying to speak of rebellion as well, and Tresting sent him to the pits of Hathsin, where he worked until he died, for like, and it took less than a month. Mm. So don't really know what the pits of Hathsin are. Don't sound so great. No, clearly not a fun place. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sounds like a, yeah it's, it sounds like a mine to me. Yeah, basically the mines in Mordor. Oh, we'll see. There you go. Yeah, it, it's just Mordor. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's, that's why there's ash falling from the sky. There's actually a the the, the red sun's actually the eye of Sauron. Yeah, it's, just, <laughs> it's it's like a secret prequel that nobody knew about. Yeah. So it turns out this is the Sauron origin story. Yeah, the scars are actually from like the ring. It burned him real good. All the way up his arm? God damn. Yeah. We're spending longer on this one than I thought, so I'm going to try to go a little faster so I don't keep everyone too long. It's like you. He says, you ask why I smile. The Lord Ruler thinks he's claimed laughter and joy for himself. I'm disinclined to let him. And then we, we get the first taste here where it says Kelsey could hear the pain contained in those. Somebody starts screaming and he hears it. And it says he burned tin. The tin sat with the other allomantic metals in within his stomach swallowed earlier waiting for him to draw upon them. And so it, he, it says that he swallowed some tin, and now he is burning it. Yeah. This is this is great. It gives me an idea of him just, like, picking up random metal objects and just being like, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, let's see. Just, just, it Imagine enhances like the senses. No, Imagine sorry, like the, 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 guy, the guy in the circus, like the knife swallower or the sword swallower, and then it's like, oh, yeah. look, it's not coming back up because I need that later. <laughs> yeah. Well, there was a there was a guy. Uh, there's a story about a guy in France who who like ate a whole airplane piece by piece out of metal because he had like a super strong stomach lining or something. And that's oh, I've heard about that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember that oh, guy's no. name. But... Is that he was alimantic? Yeah, he was he was magical uh... also. What's up? <laughs> well, I thought that was really good when they when they first made this reference when it was he was burnt in. I was like, what? But then it's sort of – you've fallen into this. You're thinking, okay, it's like, well, you know, you've got this rich guy. You've got all these peasants and, you know, life is pretty pretty hard for them. And then it just sort of snaps you and goes, whoa, hang on, this is something different. You know, what is this? Like you, you, you've sort of spent so long learning about these characters and, and their way of life. And then just, boom, straight away, here comes that magical element. Right. Um, which sort of, yeah, keeps you back on your toes as well. It turns out that the the screaming is coming from a girl. It's getting farther away, and the guy says, "Poor Jess, that child of hers was a curse. It's better for Ska not to have pretty daughters," which that's like makes you grit your teeth. At least it does to me. I'm just like, ugh. He's, he's, yeah, he's, a, he's your next reminder that life as a Ska sucks. Yeah. Right. And he says, "Does Lord Trusting ever bring the girls back when he's done?" And Menace says, "No. Lord Trusting's a law-abiding nobleman. He has the girls killed after a few weeks. He doesn't want to catch the eye of the Inquisitors. So and nobody just, likes the Inquisitors." And but the the scar themselves are just like that's just how life is. That's just yeah. how it happens. Like yeah, it's sad, but what can you do about it? And like Jesus Christ. And here's the only taste that we get of one of the reasons maybe why where Radish said it says he couldn't afford to have half breed children running around, children who might possess powers that Ska weren't even supposed to know existed. Which bears a lot of questions as to how Kelsia has these powers if he is right? Ska. Or if, yeah, even if, uh, if his powers are the powers he's talking he about. That's true too. Maybe trusting can do something. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's the the powers that Kelsier has. Maybe it's some other powers. That would be weird if there was like two whole different magic sets, I guess. Uh, so Kelsier then goes out into the night, into the mist, and everyone's like, "Oh my gosh, he went out there." And Menace is like, "Such a shame to see a man who survived the pits find death here on a random plantation, trying to protect a girl everyone else had given up for dead." 
and we skip to the morning, and all of a sudden, everyone's getting up, and they're smelling smoke. And so one of the guys is like, yeah, it always smells like smoke. The ash mounts are violent this year. But the old man is the only one who realizes something might be different about this. And they bring, they, they find the girl, the daughter, she's back. And the mom says she came pounding on the door, crying in the mist. Flynn was sure it was just a mist wraith impersonating her. But I had to let that's her a, in. That's a phrase that uh, that really gets you interested, mist wraith. Right, and that, that, that was, it, 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 that's very interesting to me at least. I'm like, wraith mm. immediately makes me think of, you know, not real like a ghost or something of yeah, the mist. Like, but I don't know what, what pictures that conjure up for you guys. I just, Wraith always makes me think of like ghost, something that doesn't really have a solid form, but sort of takes another form. And the fact that it's associated with, with mist makes me think, all right, so the ghost is just like using the mist and coming together in sort of a form out of that, that he can use to attack people. So if that's the case, maybe they're justified in being scared of going out in the mists. If there's actually yeah, yeah, totally fair. ghost things out there. It's like the, the mist, the mist is the monster. I think, too, um, I can't remember the character's name, but the character that was with Jess was like, don't, don't open the door kind of thing. Like, she, he's, she's like, but that's my, like, I couldn't, I couldn't risk it, you know. I had to, it was my daughter, I had to let her in. You know, whereas, is, is this common, like, do these mist wraiths make a habit of knocking on doors? And, like, what do they do? Do they come into people's hovels? Are they safe in the hovels? You know, do you just not open the door in the dark? I think there's a really interesting story about the, like, yeah, what what exactly are they afraid of in the mist? What do these things do? You know, do they do they come into their homes or, you know, do they um, almost bait people to come outside? You know, are they mischievous? It's, yeah, there's a lot of questions <laughs> there. I don't know. <laughs> like, mischievous they, makes them sound almost fr- almost like not as bad. You're like, they're, they're, they're just yeah. scoundrels, those mistreats. <laughs> do, they, do they trick people into walking into their own doom i don't know <laughs> well they, they did say like they thought the girl screaming was a wraith so that that does that does seem to hold reason and like they will try and trick people into coming out by imitating their loved ones or something so if they go out to see what's going on then all of a sudden the wraiths can attack or do whatever it is they do but also i think was it jess made a, a point of of saying that when they they'd gone back into the sun so she wasn't a missed wraith so it's like was was the daughter in the house for any period of time, like if it was night time when they came back or something, you know, like, at, yeah, I'm really curious about what these mist rates actually are and what they do. And, and can they be among you without you knowing Like they can't go out in the sun, but yeah, like, you know, how and, long can they be in your presence and you just not know? You know what kind of night must that be for that girl? If everyone in the hovel is suspecting you're a monster and you're spending the night in there waiting for morning so they can see if you disappear in the sun, yeah, yeah that plus, would be yeah, if, 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 she, if she's left out there, who's say a real mist wraith wouldn't show up. But then we find out nobody shows up to break up the, the group of uh, Ska getting together, uh, and uh, no, nobody comes to kill the, the old people who can't get out of the hovels in the morning, which is, is mentioned, where Menace is like, yeah, every morning I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to get up or not, but I don't want to be here when they come to kill the people who, can't, who are too old or sick to work. So it just continues to be a fucked up life for the Ska. It's like if you're too old or sick to work one day, they kill you. I just said so casually. I think that's what gets me. It's like yeah. every, to- every reminder is just like, a, oh, yeah, this is just what happens. But they but don't know any that. different. Yeah. I yeah. mean, if that, that's your whole life from birth to death. I guess you, you get used to it in some way. Yep. But then we find out that uh, all of the noble uh, Lord Trusting and everybody in the house is dead now. And uh, they're like, holy crap, he had, like, a dozen soldiers. How did one guy go and kill them all? And so, like, the only the only thing that we know about Kelsier and his magic at this point is he was burning tin, he said. That's how he phrased it. And it enhanced his senses so he could hear stuff better, he could feel stuff better. He mentions he could feel the grain of the wood on the stool that he was sitting on better. So did that in some way help him murder everyone in the house? That would be impressive. Well, of course, he mentions other other metals in his stomach as well. So I would assume if tin gives him gives his senses an overload, maybe accessing other metals in his stomach gives him like super strength or some kind of stealth power or whatever. So you think it's like a system of magic based around different metals giving you different powers? Yeah, I mean, the fact that he could have more than one, the fact that a metal could enhance him in any way. 
And then the fact that he says he has more in his stomach, that's that's kind of what leads me to believe that is that he's, there's obviously something going on with these metals that increase him in some way. Tin specifically talked about senses. It may have other powers that go along with it. But then if he's got other metals, who knows what those other ones do? What do you, what, what do you guys think? Does, does he sound like he's on something? Yeah, no, that sounds I about think so. right. I would agree. Um, yeah. Interesting. Okay. Uh, he doesn't really go into what other metals he has in his stomach. Right. So it's like it's it's. But he specifically mentions that there are others. So I guess it stands to reason that they would do different things based on that. So it's clearly dropping a I little nugget for later. Specifically, yeah. he was drawing on tin, not the metal in his stomach. So you know, obviously the tin does something that the others don't. Yeah. So they all get together and they're like, well, we have to run now because if the Lord Ruler, when when the Lord Ruler finds out what happens, we would all be blamed and get killed. And they, they basically conclude that like Kelsier did this on purpose. He knew that we wouldn't rebel on our own, so he gave us no choice. And so, I mean, based on the discussion we've already had, I assume that you guys agree with that at least, that that, that was Kelsier's yep. intention at least somewhat here. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So is he going to go around yeah, doing that in lots of places? He's definitely going to be... Like a a key player in this rebellion, he's yeah, definitely yeah. set up to be that. So, and he's the traveler. How yeah. many other places has he been to already? And yeah, and yeah. I'm I'm interested to see if he is the main character because uh, my instincts would say that most storytelling, the prologue does not center around the main character of the story. But I don't know. He seems like like the most interesting character that we've read about, even in this the prologue and the and the following chapter so it'd be a shame if he's not at least one of the main players if not the main character yeah definitely yep. well, they've left lots of questions unanswered about him too so it would be kind of disappointing if he didn't show up again i guess <laughs> <laughs> okay so we move into part one which is actually titled the survivor of hath sin so definitely seems related to kelsier in some way since we just found out that he's the survivor and he was at the pits of hath sin and we touched on the the epigraph already. We kind of talked about that, where he's whoever is writing this is just I can he's kind of thinking of or he he or she he calls himself a man of principle, so I assume it's a he. But he's like uh, perhaps another person would name me a religious tyrant. What makes that man's opinion less valid than mine? But he ends with I guess it all comes down to one fact. In the end, I'm the one with the armies. So, I, you know, we talked about whether this is somebody who's going to be in the story or whether these are kind of in-universe quotes that are relevant to the the story in some way or just maybe theologically relevant. So I guess we'll see as we move on, hopefully, what uh, that leads to. And so then we've, we get Ash fell from the sky again, and Vin is watching this, and it says that Vin sat quietly in one of the crew's watch holes. So we find out that she's a member of a thieving crew. Does it say she is Scar herself, or...? Uh, let's see. Because she talks about the other members of the crew having to pose as Scar, which would imply yeah. that, like, I don't know if that's just a case that they just dress differently. They dressed above their station, and they, they are Scar who dressed above their station, or they're not, and, they're, and they have to pretend to be for this scam to work. That's, that's an interesting question. So whether they're noblemen thieves or Ska thieves or something. Yeah. We know they're scamming somebody, but... Yeah. We don't know all that much about them at this point. We also talked a little bit already about, you know, not not everyone, you know, can be a lord. So, you know, maybe maybe they are, you know, the same the same people, but obviously at a lesser station, but not quite scar. There's got to there's got to be other people in the civilization. You can't just have slaves and nobility. Right. Yeah, I guess like you need somebody in between. There's the working class between the pe- between the slaves and the lords. Well, and they, and at the be- in the prologue, especially when it's, they're kind of addressing them as we talked about how almost as creatures and not, for lack of a better term, human. I don't know if they've actually talked about being human or not, but they're, they're based they're roughly humanoid, I guess, and we know that at least. But yeah, I, it it really made me wonder at that time if you can tell the difference between a nobleman and a ska if they're you know so different from each other that you could tell if they're not actually the same species i guess but we learn at later in this chapter at least that some guys go from looking dressing as noblemen to dressing as ska and impersonating one or the other based on clothes like uh, somebody already mentioned so they must look at least enough alike that you can't tell at a glance or only based on the clothes 
which one is which. Which, I guess, you know, once again, we, we don't know what, what the our main characters in this chapter are. But she starts out yeah. thinking, she tar- starts out talking about how she likes solitude, and her brother said, when you're alone, no one can betray you. He, he probably did it, did it himself. It's the only way you'll learn. Anyone will betray, betray you then, anyone. So that's the life that she leads. And that's not very cheerful either, whether or not she's a ska. I can't imagine having that kind of attitude where it's like, no, you can't trust anyone ever. Not for one second. They will all betray you. Yeah, I guess it's pretty rough. Like just living on living on the streets, like you have to, you know, like every, every story about someone who lives on the streets is just like you have to look out for yourself first. You can't trust anyone, you know. That's true. Just playing, playing into those trappings. It's familiar ground applied to an unfamiliar setting, which helps, you know, get used to the story and the character. It's like, cool, I know what this person wants, and I know, like, roughly their situation. That's a good point. It's kind of it's kind of a trope at this point, like the street kids or whatever, or anyone, like, making a living living on the streets. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. We meet Ulef, Alef, and we meet Kamen, who is in charge of their thieving crew, and he's also an asshole. He's an asshole who is skilled at acting, apparently. Yeah, like that's – she goes on for a while about it, but that's the the gist of it, that you're like, he's he's a good actor. He can play, like, self-important and pompous really well, and that makes him, like, valuable in some way. Yeah, because, like, the other guy uh, whose name escapes me at this point who put together this scam is just like, I don't want to actually – I actually don't want to deal with you. I, like, And um, Vin thinks he's looking at uh, Cayman like he wants, to, he wants to kill him once this is all done, but for the moment he needs him, and yeah. he's from a, a different – He's from a different crew, so it's like, all right, you're clearly good enough that someone from another crew is willing to put up with you to make this happen. Yeah, so Cameron's in a bad mood, and Vin thinks maybe it's about the rebellion on a provincial lord's plantation. Themos Tresting had apparently been murdered, and his manor burned to the ground. So I guess that at least sets us in time in comparison with the prologue. We know that that wasn't 100 years ago. Yeah, that was fairly recent. And then it doesn't it doesn't say where that happened, does it? I'm just looking at the map now, and it doesn't say which area Tresting's estate was, does it? It just says several days to the north. Okay. Which, if when you look at the map, it's laid out a little bit weird as far as north, south, east, east and west, uh, just to start with, because north is kind of like the upper right or something, but or well, at least yeah. the northern the northern dominance is in the upper right. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Let's see. So and then we get Vin using a bit of her luck to calm Cameron's nervousness so that he would not hit her again. So it doesn't explicitly say this is burning metal or anything. I was just wondering, it's like now is this the same power and she just doesn't know that's what it is, which is why she doesn't describe it in those terms, or is this something completely different? Right. It's, it's definitely something finite because she says she's using up the last of it at some point, but. Which I, I guess that would fit with burning metals if you were using up metals while you did that, but it yeah. could fit with any number of other things too. So I don't know. Yeah. What do you guys think? Is is luck related to what we saw Kelsier or heard about Kelsier do? It's quite possible. Not willing to commit too much. Got it. <laughs> it, it, it it's early goings yet. We're only two chapters. <laughs> Not even really technically two chapters. So yeah. It said, uh, let's see. Cameron is very convincing in his nobleman's suit, which to me says that maybe he's a ska. Uh, and managing to be a convincing noble. But it's not... I don't know that it says it ever specifically, in this chapter at least. Um, the other guy comes in. Theron is his name. The other crew leader. And this is his scam. And he hired Cameron to do this bit of it. And so Vin, Vin thinks about, you know, how these two guys don't like each other. And they're, they want to put a knife in each other's back, basically, as soon as the scam is over. And then there's a creepy moment where the guy looks at her and she's like, I don't look as old as 16, but some men prefer those kind of women. And so that's kind of an, uh, to me at uh, least. Yeah, right. It's definitely, definitely it's just boring. creepy. And then Vin makes a suggestion where she's like, hey, the, the servants, you know, Lord Jeddu, who you're impersonating, is supposed to be desperate. He'd have rich clothing left for himself, but he wouldn't be able to afford such rich servants. And then Cam and hits her again. She can't waste. She can't risk using up her precious remaining luck, and then, or he thinks about hitting her again, and then he's like, "Why do you provoke me, Vin? Why, yeah. why do you make me hit you?" It's just uh, t- t- <sighs> typical abuser talk. Yeah, it really is. It just it, because it, I mean, he's basically her meal ticket, isn't? 
like, isn't she? She's hanging out with him because, like, that's how she gets money and food and whatnot. Yeah, for sure. And they make reference to the brother left him with a debt. Yeah. And so I think she she is useful to him, but she she effectively is having to pay the brother's debt. Right, like some kind of indentured servitude. Right. Yeah, he says that her brother left with a debt, and did, do you realize a less merciful man would have sold you to the horror masters long ago? It just it just keeps punching in you in the face with like this is a shitty life for this character. Yeah. He makes it out that it's like it's his mercy, but she makes yeah. a point that he finds her useful, you know. So because things just seem to go better when she's around. So while she's got she's able to to use her luck to help them with all these scams, you know, she's useful. So he's not he's yeah he's not he's gonna say it's he's being merciful to her, but. It's really about this is better for him. He doesn't. He can't explain it. He doesn't know why things just go better. But having her around makes things go better. Yeah, I mean that's once again like like Dex said. That's kind of like abuser talk where it's like absolutely. I'm gonna gaslight you at the same time to make make it be like I'm the nice guy helping you out while I'm abusing you. It's just it's unpleasant. Yeah. So do you like? I, I think Jamie brought up a good point. Do you guys think that he does know what is going on, like why she's useful to have around, or is it just like a superstitious thing? I think it's said somewhere he doesn't know. He just he knows that something about her, but he doesn't know how or why. And uh, frankly, I, I don't think he even really cares. He's just like, all right, well, this works. I'm going to keep you around because it uh, benefits me. I don't really give a crap how, how it works. I just know that it does. Right. Yeah, I think he keeps her more around as, like, a good luck charm. Like, he doesn't understand that there's actually a power that she is using. Because if, if he did, he might get wise to the fact that she uses it on him. So I, I think he, he just sees her as a good luck charm, not necessarily that she has any kind of power specifically. Yeah. Do you think if he did know that he would rec- that he, he would be mad about the fact that she uses it on him as long as she was also using it to like make his plan succeed. I think so because he's the sort of guy who would be like I want to be in complete control of like everything right. around me including mm. my people. So if he finds out that one of his subordinates is using a power on him to make him act differently to how he actually would, he would not take that well. He'd, I think he'd also be um, trying to use her in a more lucrative way than he's currently using her. Apparently, this is a big money job. They're saying there's thousands of boxings on the line. We don't know what that is yet, necessarily. Maybe it's pennies, but it seems unlikely. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those rolls millions, of millions of pennies! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just the guy walks in with like one of those old money bags with the dollar sign on it. It's like, yep, right. here it is. Here's, here's all the boxings. <laughs> okay, so we have we have Kamen start meets with a uh, an obligator, and the obligator's like, oh, I'm sorry, we already the Canton of Finance. So we've heard about two Cantons now, the the Canton of Finance and the Canton of Inquisition. But he says the Canton of Finance has already voted on your proposal, and we're not going to accept it. And Vin's over here thinking about how she would do the job. She's like, he came to meet you. That means he's still interested in negotiating. Clearly, she thinks that she would make a, a better crew leader. Maybe she's right. I mean, she definitely seems to think like she thinks more analytically than he appears to, at least. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and just random behind the scenes fun. I uh, Brandon Sanderson has on his website, which I do not encourage you, you. You guys cannot go read because there's spoilers in it. But for some <laughs> of his early books, he has annotations for each chapter of the book where he kind of talks about the writing process and the different thoughts that he had. And so I might bring some of that in from time to time. If it's not going to spoil anything and if it's an interesting little tidbits for this chapter, he specifically talks about how he wrote Cameron and has been making these suggestions. And he had to try to strike a balance where Vin it's, it's all from Vin's perspective. So, you know, she thinks Cam is doing a bad job. Maybe he is, maybe he isn't, or not doing what she would do. But he has to try to write it so that Cam does things like have the rich servants at first that Vin can, you know, comment on and be active in the story and try to risk herself by suggesting a difference. But you also have to make him capable enough in the writing that it makes sense for him to be the leader of a crew. He can't be an yeah. idiot or somebody would have like put a knife in his back already. Yeah, that's true. 
Yeah, and I, I mean, I, she doesn't whisper to him that he's here, so that means he need he's he can negotiate, right? He, no, no, the, she's just thinking that. Right, the bot, and and I feel like her her boss feels that too. He recognizes it too because he keeps the dialogue going. Yeah, he definitely is not just giving up. No. He's he, he's still pitching his uh, his whole shtick, where he's like, yeah, you know, we're almost broke, but that's good for you. Hey, you, you know, you, we can give you a great deal because that'll show confidence in us and other people will follow and we can make our money off of them. Right. It was, like, it was an interesting argument. Yeah. But basically, like, was, you're our only customer, so we're going to treat you like royalty and then we'll get it. We'll get other customers and make money on them. Yeah. But it's like, you know, you know that we will do the job and we will do it for less than the other people going for it. And we will devote our whole attention to it because we don't have any other customers. I'm like. That's a clever way of putting it, I guess. And apparently the other guy who set up the scam has been building towards this for a while, so it's it's all part of some bigger scam. But an interesting little note that I like in this is that the whole thing we find out in this chapter is that he's, like, running boats. Like, uh, he's trying to get them to use them to bring their people up here on their boats, their canal boats, which is the same oh, thing yeah. that... We saw Trusting say earlier that the Obligator and the uh, and his new outfit came on the canal boat this morning. So, so it, that's the main method of travel in this empire, then. Yeah, it, it gives you it gives you a little look into like apparently that is how people travel on boats through canals, which one has to wonder why that is. Why don't you have a system of roads? But uh, yeah, maybe no mist on the water. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Mm. Uh, maybe boats are just faster than. Actually, did they, have they ever mention anything about base of burden? So far, are there none? I don't know that we've heard anything about them yet, but we haven't seen any. You know, we haven't actually seen one of the boats or anything, so or a carriage or whatever, whatever they use to get around. I assume that if you're going around, you know, day to day in a city, you're not taking a boat. But maybe, maybe it's Venice. Yeah, possibly. I mean, but yeah, it's like they haven't even mentioned horses or anything like that, like the standards for fantasy things. So maybe there's just maybe they're extinct or they never existed. Who knows? Um, and so you think about the landscape build- as well. Like it, all, you've got all this ash falling. You've got people that are, you know, working tires, tirelessly to keep ash off plantations and things like that. Maybe the terrain is just you just can't travel on it. Like there's people not tending to it. Maybe the waterways are just more efficient to travel. That's actually that's a good thought because I mean yeah, if you have a road that's traveling out through the middle of nowhere, you either have to have someone clean the ash off the road, or you can't you let it stack up. Presumably, on like a canal, the water's moving. Maybe the water washes it away. Maybe it melts in water. I don't know. Maybe the water's just really fetid. It's just really gross water, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it wouldn't be swimming in it. <laughs> Let's see. So he says that the ministry would be remiss not to consider this opportunity. And the Laird is the name of this obligator. So, yes, he does get a name. The steel ministry was not just a force of bureaucracy and legal authority in the final empire. It was like a noble house unto itself, and the more wealth it had, the better its own mercantile contracts, the more leverage the various ministry cantons had with each other and with the noble houses. So that tells us a lot about how the society is working in that there's noble houses with, like, contracts making money and the different parts of the steel ministry, as they call it here, the different cantons – are vying with each other and they have their own mercantile contracts and making their own money off. Uh, I almost said the stock exchange, but that doesn't seem to be. The case. <laughs> <laughs> and then Vin uses her luck. I don't, I, I, I just have to say, this seems like a really inefficient way to run a government where they're involved in like these sort of uh, deals with merchants and trying to get the best contracts for each different department in the government. To go capitalism i guess i don't know it's sure. weird i mean you know it, it makes sense I, like my company deals a lot with uh, uh government contracts at the moment and we're competing against other businesses to try and win the contract from each other but it's for a spe- it will be for a specific department of the government and then other departments will have to negotiate other contracts with so like it's that that's not i wouldn't i wouldn't say it's unfamiliar ground all right yeah, i don't know yeah it's, it, it didn't it didn't seem that unfamiliar to me i guess all right Oh, uh, Vin uses her luck. Then she pushes harder. So there's degrees here. I like. I just like the way it's like he cocked his head, looking thoughtful, opened his mouth to speak, 
And she used her last bit of luck, and he says, okay, I'll take your proposal to the council. And that brings us to the end of the chapter. So apparently her luck worked here. Whatever the power is, we still don't know. Well, I mean, her luck works insofar as this this stage of the scam. He's going to take the proposal back to the council. There's still nothing to say this plan is going to work for them and that the, the council is going to go for this proposal, so... Right. And I mean, yeah, I mean, she, then she's done her job, but to use the luck on them. So no. So any number of things can still go wrong for them. And knowing Cayman, Cayman, however you want to pronounce it, like he's probably going to take that out on his underlings. And we've already seen he likes to um, hit her. So you know, if things do go sour, it's not look, going to look good for her, probably. Yeah, especially if she's the good luck charm who was supposed to make the deal go through. Yeah, I get. I just get the impression it's like when things go right, he, sure, she's the good luck charm. But if she's a, but you know, if she's the good luck charm and good luck doesn't come their way for whatever reason, like she, like I feel like things would happen to her uh, even worse than anyone else. Because like you were supposed to make sure this didn't happen, or something. I don't know. I don't. I don't have a good feeling about what's coming for her. Yeah. And if she's talking about she's lose, she's just used the last of her luck. Mm-hmm. Can she can like I mean this is where we're going to learn a bit more about I guess her power and possibly she will learn a bit more about her power depending on how much she knows already. But can she get more luck? Has she just you know outlived her usefulness? Like what's what's going to happen to her character now? Yeah, I mean she doesn't mention the metal, so if it is the same power, she presumably doesn't know that, know how it works. So she's just getting metal somehow and burning it without realizing is. Potentially, like if there's like I, I don't know if there's trace metal in the food that they eat every day, and she just feels like, oh, I feel like I can do this now. You wouldn't want a bunch of metal in your food, but yeah, I'm sure there's traces <laughs> in everything that we eat of random stuff. I read I, I read somewhere that like in the U.S. the FDA will allow chocolate to be at least 15% cockroach parts and consider it pure chocolate <laughs> because apparently they Happy lay their Easter, eggs everyone. in the cocoa beans. So <laughs> yeah. gets ground up with the cocoa sure. beans. Yeah, they they allow like a large percentage of maggots to be in maraschino cherries too. Oh jeez. Oh. So yeah, they, yeah, that's a good place to uh, to get towards the end. But yes, all that to say that there could totally be metal in in her food or something. It's true. Well, I don't know. It's like the old joke of like, oh, how much iron is in the meat that we're eating? You know, like that's X-Men true. Magneto yeah. style. So stuff like you know, you have a good steak, and all of a sudden, like, oh yeah, right. I've got good luck powers now. <laughs> Of course, you'd, you'd have to be careful because you, assuming this world works like ours, you need that metal to you know live. Your your blood needs it to be alive. So well, yeah, that's also like true. Iron or something, but if other metal might be like you know poisonous to you if uh, you ate it. So sure, if their bodies yeah. work the same way ours do. Yeah. Okay, so the last segment that we're gonna do is we can we can th- this whole discussion actually lets us taper quite nicely into predictions i want everyone to make some predictions i'm thinking about as we proceed maybe even keeping score about whose predictions <laughs> turn out and whose oh, don't no. but for now we won't <laughs> we're I, competing I, let's go <laughs> <laughs> so what do you guys uh we'll, we'll, we'll let dat go first this time what do you think uh any kind of prediction you want to make you know uh what's going to happen next chapter throughout the whole book who's going to show up who's going to die stuff whatever I feel like, um, like like I said, I don't have a good feeling about how this whole deal and everything is going to go down. I feel like something is going to go wrong, and I feel like Cayman will blame Vin for it, and Vin will probably have to go on the run or something like that, and she, I don't know, she'll probably bump into Kelsia down the line, because I, like I definitely feel like we haven't seen the last of him. I feel like, yeah, she will probably get caught up in this rebellion that he's trying to ferment around and about everywhere. So the job is going to go sideways, and Kelsey is going to show up. So you think the yep. job will go sideways, but not not like through any fault of their own, basically. It's uh... I don't know at this point, but it's like I, I I just feel like you know if there's if there's a plan in a story, it's going to go wrong somewhere. Um, that's, if, yeah, that's a good point. Like like if like in a, in any story, if like if there is a plan and you know about the plan. Those ones don't work. If the if if you as the reader or the viewer don't know about the plan, then it usually comes off without a hitch because you find out about it after the fact. In this case, like we know what the scam is, we know what's going to happen. So I feel like, all right, this is going to go downhill pretty quick. And I don't know how, I don't know why, but I feel like for whatever reason, like my prediction is, Cayman will blame Vin whether or not it's actually her fault, and that's gonna 
really drive a wedge because like I don't know the, the brief glints we saw of Theron seemed to indicate he doesn't stuff around like like Cayman does and if he starts blaming her as well then she's really going to have a rough time of it she's going to have to really go on the run to avoid both their groups are going to come after her with knives and yeah, so that- I mean, e- speaking of him, of Theron or whatever his name was, is even if the job goes perfectly, she was theorizing that like they're waiting to stab each other in the back, these the crew leaders themselves. So everything could go right, and it could still be trouble for them if yeah, she's that's right true. about like the attitude that they have. Yep, that is also a possibility. Okay, Jamie, any predictions? Uh, I look, I would sort of tend to agree. I think Vin is probably going to be separated from the group somehow, whether she runs away or, I don't know, something. it's obviously not going to go well, whatever's about to happen. I do think that she and Kelsia will probably join up. I think it would be really interesting if she doesn't know about her powers, if they're similar, to have sort of Kelsia guide her through that, maybe teach her that. I'm also... Is Kelsia maybe, you know... Uh, half breed effectively as well. I think it'd be really interesting to see how that story plays out. You know, if, if these powers are, you know, the magical powers that we're talking about that they're not supposed to have, you know, how does he have these? And I think that's how he's ended up with powers. So that's my prediction. Is he like a half breed? And if you have to be like a half breed to have powers, does that mean the Vin is also, or we, I don't Mm. know. Possibly, that, that's, yeah. That's interesting. Okay, Joe, your turn. Um, my they they predicted things that that were in my head too, but I'll say this one one other thing I was thinking is I I predict I hope that we learn more about how these powers manifested and if Vin really is the other survivor of the of the pit or whatever the Hosfin whatever it is. Um, I would hope that that ties in some way. But I don't know. I just keep thinking in the title Mistborn, Mistborn. So my my assumption is that the mists gave them whatever powers they have and that being out in the mists, um, something happened to them, something, um, whether they were born in it or molded by it, something happened to give them these powers. And I hope that uh, my prediction is that they'll hopefully go into more detail about that and how that works. Interesting. So it's like the mists have to be involved because of the title. I guess that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It could be just like philosophical also, I suppose. Or it's like if you have these powers and the mists are mystical, then they're related somehow in people's minds. But yeah, it could be. Well, more the, the f- yeah, I mean, the fear that they had of the mists, the, they keep bringing that, you know, they brought up the mist that comes at night. It's it's uh, it's also got a very Game of Thrones feel to it as well so i feel like i feel like it has something to do with the mist for sure okay interesting i guess we will find out so as, here as we're as we're starting to wrap up the episode i wanted to get y'all's opinions on uh did you feel like this was an appropriate amount of content do you feel like we could have done another chapter or do you want to do one chapter at a time uh what were y'all's thoughts on that i think this was probably a good amount yeah considering you know we're aiming for hour-long episodes uh i'd say probably two chapters would be the limit looking at how yeah. long we've already gone for yeah. um but yeah I, I mean, it's it's also it's also means that there's enough time to dissect small like chapters if we're trying to do three chapters in that time we simply wouldn't have enough time i think no. we, we definitely have to go a little faster and skip over <laughs> as much detail as and and that's probably partly my fault i'm i'm stopping you guys a lot to ask for opinions on stuff but it's also partly because we're just entering the world so everything is new and kind of interesting at this point yeah, I feel like we really dissected it quite a bit more than I was anticipating. So, <laughs> not not that that's bad. I'm just saying that you know. Jamie, are you okay with this this number? Yeah, no, I think it's it's good. I mean, this okay. yeah did go a little bit longer, but it is a brand new world for us. So, you know. Yeah, it's, really got to wrap our heads around yeah, it. I think two is good. Two chapters. Okay. Then for the next episode, we will plan on chapters two and three. That's right, listeners. You, if you're reading along, chapters two and three we will discuss in the next episode. And let's see. I want to touch on – oh, yes. If um, you guys, anyone listening, you can uh, leave us reviews and rate us, please, on Apple Podcasts. That will help get the attention of more people. You can send emails to the Sanderlanch. There's an E on the end of that, just like on Avalanche, at gmail.com. 
or check us out on the Facebook page, the Sander Lanch page on uh, on Facebook, which isn't actually up in reality yet, uh, but will be before the episode comes out. I'm wanting to get like at least uh, two or three of these kind of in the box before we put the first one out so that we're a little bit ahead. Uh, which means if anybody does send in any emails or stuff, it may not be picked, uh, you know, it may not be mentioned, uh, whatever questions or comments you had the very next episode, because I'm hoping to be ahead if everything works out. Fingers crossed. But until next time, thanks, everyone, for listening. Bring